Hey, Mass Effect 3's infamous endings are perhaps my favourite of all time. Listen to yourself. You're indoctrinated. This is a terrible idea. I'd love to hear your thoughts on this, by the way. I'm, I'm not saying I'm objectively right or anything. Also, spoilers, of course. 2012's Mass Effect 3 is the third and final major entry in the Mass Effect trilogy, which tells the story of its protagonist, Commander Shepard, as they seek to save the known galaxy from an unknowable galactic threat, the Reapers. These giant Lovecraftian space monsters, it transpires, arrive in the Milky Way galaxy every 50,000 years or so to harvest all advanced interstellar civilizations. This is a response to the allegedly inevitable outcome of technological advances, which is that synthetic life forms, you know, Siri and such, will always end up going all Skynet and wiping out their organic creators. By preventing organics from progressing to this point, the Reapers are able to preserve organic life, rather than seeing it entirely eradicated. We slowly learn this across the course of the three games, and to cut a very long story short, we are given four godlike choices at the end of the trilogy regarding how to resolve this whole problem. Option A is to destroy the Reapers and all synthetic life, allowing the species of this cycle to live beyond their 50,000 year expiration date and into the foreseeable future. Option B is for Commander Shepard to sacrifice their corporeal form in order to themselves assume control of the Reapers, which will effectively allow them to police the galaxy with regards to the existence of artificial intelligences and to apply their frankly infallible judgement to a less genocide-heavy preservation of galactic peace. Option C comes at the cost of Shepard's whole life, body, soul and everything in between, but involves the synthesis of all organic and synthetic life in the galaxy, ensuring that all life is part synthetic and part organic, and that there will never be an eradication of either as each shall continue to exist in every life form in the galaxy. And option D, which was added after the game's release, is to shoot this annoying ghost kid or just tell them that you think that their solutions are bullshit, at which point you have officially rejected all of the galaxy's survivable solutions, meaning that the Reapers will continue their harvest in order to facilitate the continued existence of organic life. And these endings were despised. After years of making choice after choice in the Mass Effect series, in a game that had brought so many of those decisions from prior moments and prior games to fruition, the whole story was seen as just kind of boiling down to which colour explosion do you like best. It wasn't seen as at all doing justice to the story or the world or the characters or the fans, and everyone and their mum almost immediately knew that Mass Effect 3 had really fucked up big time. There were allegations of false advertising, because, well, I guess that back then people just weren't as used to games dropping in a completely different state to what was promised to them. And review bombing back then wasn't what it is now, in that it was actually directed and helpful and made sense. So there was a campaign called Retake Mass Effect designed to get Bioware to give the trilogy a better ending, and lo and behold it actually worked. By the end of June there was a free DLC extended cut expansion pack which added more context to each ending, fleshing them out with information on the story and player choices that did more to align the endings with what people were expecting from the start and definitely helped to alleviate some of the issues that people have with the state of things at launch. But it certainly didn't eradicate every one of the fans' concerns, and by then the damage was already done. Mass Effect fans had to wait five years for the next game, Mass Effect Andromeda, which still didn't know how to deal with the fallout of the last few minutes of Mass Effect 3, and so was set in an entirely different galaxy, using a cast of characters who had set off to settle in Andromeda before the events of Mass Effect 3, and therefore very conveniently knew nothing about it. I'll probably make a video about that game someday, because I've been meaning to since I started this channel, but finer details aside, it did not go down well, and the momentum of the series seemed to have stopped dead, I think that, for many, the games became a hefty investment with a largely inaccessible opening title with many features that belonged before the streamlined shooters that began to emerge in the late 2000s, a third entry with an ending so derided that it seemed to represent almost every bit of discourse surrounding the game, and a spin-off sequel that, by all accounts, failed to capture any of the magic of the original, blundering to such an extent that they cancelled the single-player downloadable content that was planned to supplement the story. But, like, Andromeda is so removed from the main trilogy, and the first game is still a fantastic experience, so was, was it all the endings? Because it kind of seems that way. 
lengthy side note, actually. Sorry, I know this is already taking ages, and you're going to have to get used to that, because fucking hell, this is a long one. But I do think it's weird, like, the extent to which this whole controversy seemed to affect the general reputation and motion of the series as a whole. Not only does pretty much the entire controversy stem from the final 15 minutes of a 100 plus hour trilogy, but Mass Effect 3 was also, apart from those moments, widely adored by the vast majority of those who played it. The game has been included in several lists of the greatest games of either the 2010s or even all time, as a quick look on Wikipedia will show. <clears throat> And even amidst the heat of the endings debate in 2012, Mass Effect 3 made it onto Time Magazine's list of the 100 greatest video games ever made, where Jared Newman puts its endings into perspective through simply stating, it's not the destination, it's the journey. And frankly, I agree. Mass Effect was one of the most beloved and acclaimed gaming franchises of its time, and it's a lukewarm take at most to suggest that outside of its endings, it's pretty much a perfect coda to Commander Shepard's story. This video isn't about the game as a whole, so I'll try to refrain from gushing about it, but it is, I would argue, one of the very best single-player stories that I've ever experienced. And that's backed up by the roaring successes of the much-loved Citadel DLC and the immensely popular online multiplayer that was entertaining enough to maintain a dedicated player base even into the 2020s. Like, I, I haven't looked into it, but I'm fairly certain that you could find a match today and the game is over 11 years old. Eurogamer ranked Maldin's final scene as one of their top moments of 2010's gaming, and I think that that's a great example of the significance of the story building up to the endings. Mass Effect 3 is full of incredible moments, and although they maintain the narrative drive of Shepard's struggle against the Reapers, none of them feels reduced to simply being a vehicle or a petrol station where you fill up on the way to your final destination. Even aside from the addition of the extended cut, this game and this series deserved more than to be defined by the sour flavour that many were, understandably, left with. But that's not what happened. The new generation had arrived, and Mass Effect as a major player in the landscape of AAA games seemed to be a thing of the past. And although you can never count on a franchise being dead these days, it didn't seem all that likely that it could slow this impressive decline. Until, that is, 2020, when Bioware announced both a new sequel a long way down the line and the Mass Effect Legendary Edition, a remastered version of the original trilogy with all of the single player stories and DLC included. And that long, long explanation of the series up until now brings us to, well, now, and here, and with me. My last video was a complete and utter failure. It ended up being blocked in almost every country on Earth, and not in any way being good enough to justify the nearly two years that I spent making it happen. So I really lost all motivation for a while there. In an attempt to bounce back from this, I was all like, let's make a video on Mass Effect. That'll be relaxing. I love those games, and in typically late fashion, I just recently finished up playing through the Legendary Edition. What fun! Feeling renewed, I got to planning a new video, and I was going to be talking today about the storytelling successes of one of the franchise's key characters. But then, as the result of an as-yet-unexplained technological crisis that is most definitely, most definitely not entirely my own fault, I managed to lose all of my clips from everything prior to the very last mission of this 135-hour trilogy, which was... good. Also, as I record this, I woke up this morning when a glass full of water fell on my head and smashed, so uh, things are not going great. But luckily, I've held some pretty strong opinions on the endings of Mass Effect 3 ever since I first played through the game over a decade ago now, so only having footage of that final mission hasn't proven all that much of a problem for me. Everything's coming up, Millhouse! So let's take a sad song and make it better as we finally take a look into the endings that, so strangely, tainted the entire franchise's stellar reputation. And why this seems extra strange to me personally, because, in my opinion, Mass Effect 3 has perhaps the best ending bracket s close bracket of any game that I've ever played. Hold up. What? That's right, I'm going to stop doing this bit now because this doesn't actually feel like all that crazy of an opinion, to be honest. Also, it's in the title of the video, so if you were shocked by this, then, um... But 
In spite of everything that you see and hear and smell and feel about the aforementioned sour taste that this game's endings imparted upon many of the fans of the series, the closing moments of this game just seem so obviously brilliant to me that I don't feel like that's a particularly controversial belief. And as much as it might sound like it, that's not me saying that you have to like the way that these games end. You can hate them with a burning passion if that's how you feel, and I'd love to hear from you if it is, because you do you, you know? But I do think it's interesting that they were such a widespread point of controversy and ridicule when, to me, they get so much so damn right. So what is it? Could I really be so delusional? No, it's everyone else who is wrong. But honestly, I do think that they're a thoroughly overhated conclusion to a frankly incredible game. And I'm not the only member of Big Media TM who thinks this way either. Returning to research.com for a second, we can see that Informatively, in the years following its release, Mass Effect 3 has received retrospective attention, with much of it focusing on the ending controversy with admiration. For example, a 2017 article by James Davenport of PC Gamer opined that the game's ending received an inordinate amount of criticism, and while he agreed that the ending was problematic- wait, this doesn't fit my narrative. But that does. Wait, this is the wrong part of the video altogether. I'm lost. Oh yeah, the ending is good, actually. The extended cut, which is included by default in the Legendary Edition, goes a long way towards helping this for me. And it's true that without it, I definitely wouldn't be putting the end of Mass Effect 3 on such a pedestal. The DLC incorporates into the endings a greater understanding of the ramifications of each outcome and additional information on the fates of our squadmates and the galaxy as a whole. And also, I haven't played or even just watched the original version of the endings for well, long enough that I can't remember if I played or even just watched them. Played, I think. Look, either way, it's been over a decade and I don't think it would be fair for me to go into why I love the original, or whatever, especially as, you know, I don't. I think that a lot of the criticisms made at the time were very, very fair, and it's understandable that many felt aggrieved by the three simple, impersonal endings that, again, seemingly only really differed in the colour that the Catalyst's interstellar explosion took on. Nowadays, however, the red-blue-green criticism is definitely outdated, and in fact, it has been since the summer of 2012. The continued criticism of Mass Effect 3's three similar endings is simply based upon a falsehood. The game, in fact, has eight different endings, with four possible choices and a range of degrees of success, dependent upon how effectively you were able to ready the galaxy for the final conflict with the Reapers. And each of these endings, in my opinion, well, with the possible exception of Reject, I guess, manages to present itself as a positive reflection of the ideas that the series values most. The game is about the characters and the political landscape and your interactions with each of those, and especially when playing with the extended cut and the Citadel DLC installed, the endings give players a satisfying conclusion to those elements. And that's what it should be about, right? sealing off the trilogy with a consistent and reasonable roundup of its strongest and most important aspects, which is a good example, I would say, of an ending doing things that an ending, a true ending rather than just the franchise written announcement trailers that get bolted onto the end of a lot of narratives these days, should do. And the build up to the Catalyst confrontation is, for me, so perfectly panned out that I can't help but feel that it strengthens the ending as a whole. Like, once you've passed a narrative point of no return, after which you can't carry out any side quests or go off exploring the galaxy, and must instead focus upon the main narrative until the game is over, the remainder of the game is several hours long, and that time is spent fulfilling all of the requirements in both intensity and emotional culmination that I think anyone could really expect of the title. We get the cathartic conflict with Kai Leng, the vile Cerberus assassin who has plagued our attempts to survive the Reaper threat throughout the title. A chance to say goodbye to each of our surviving squadmates from throughout the series as we see what they're up to in the final moments of the war. A climactic and challenging final showdown with the relentless horde of the Reaper forces as we finally take the fight to them and clear a path for the final charge on the beam. And one of my favourite moments in the entire franchise, the showdown between Shepard, Anderson and the elusive man that's fought with words as two ideologies collide in the eye of the storm. For me, it's a fitting final moment for probably the two most prominent non-Normandy crew member characters in the series, two who've had run-ins before and now represent the human figureheads of each side of the greatest war in galactic history. 
and two mutually exclusive ideas of how humanity should exist in the galactic space, and, more pressingly, how they should deal with the existential threat that's posed by the emergence of the Reapers. I find this whole exchange to be captivating, and maybe it's because I love the three dudes arguing over life or death decisions in an isolated space dynamic. Now listen, you the right of stop calling here. me a crypto Nazi. Let's, let's stop or calling I'll names you and let's in your get... goddamn face, and let's... you'll stay plastered. But I also think that my love of that probably stems from playing this as a kid, and how well it's executed here. Not to mention the last exchange between Shepard and Anderson, which is genuinely really touching, and just feels like the cherry on the icing on the cake with regards to the beautiful build-up to the true ending. After all, Keith David said he was proud of me. What more could I ask for from a game? And then finally, after all of this, when Shepard is, as they were always going to be, the only one capable of making it there to activate the catalyst and defeat the Reapers, we are finally allowed to ascend into the realm of the ending, of the final moments of this galaxy-spanning trilogy, of something beyond the emblem that the elusive man saw and the soldier that Anderson saw. I think that this is when Shepard finally becomes THE Shepard, as the child in the epilogue calls them, something more than any other soldier or ambassador or even any spectre. Shepard's legend lies in these final moments, and for me that just goes to show how these last few hours of the game are a fitting destination for what I would call the greatest journey in video game history. And thematically, the endings are also pretty consistent with the rest of the trilogy, particularly in retrospect following the revelations of our conversation with the Catalyst. Now, I'm going to go over all of this a bit more in part two, but for those of you who played the trilogy, and more importantly, replayed the trilogy, you'll probably know how frequently the ideas espoused in the final moments of the third game are littered throughout the franchise. The solutions of destruction, control, and synthesis are all present at earlier points throughout the story, and the inevitability of the conflict between synthetic and organic life does, at least at a first glance, make sense within our understanding of the history of the Mass Effect universe, whether it's fighting a rogue AI or freeing the synthetic species known as the Geth, unshackling Edie as Joker or rewriting the heretics with Legion. The parameters of the chaotic natural life against the orderly artificial existence, though derided as a whimsical organic perception, are at least somewhat present in some form or another throughout each entry. These questions being asked in the background during the prior games, and in the foreground in the third, all seem logical, unavoidable even, following what we learn about the millions of years of conflicts preceding the present cycle, and the inexorability that necessitated the creation of the Catalyst, and, in turn, the Reapers. And each time I play through the game, and those final moments in particular, I'm thankful that this is the direction in which Bioware decided to take the third entry, especially given the other endings, other paths, that were considered. Like, not that this in any way affects the quality of the existent endings, but the other proposed endings are, in my opinion, kind of shit. <laughs> Some of the ideas that were floated included the Reapers working to save the universe from organic species with biotic potential, which, for those of you who don't know, is just like space telekinesis. It's kind of like regular telekinesis, but it's blue. Shepard luring the Reapers into a trap and blowing them up. Another Rachni Queen situation, but with a big Reaper boss this time. The Reapers' efforts to prevent the use of dark energy by organic life. And Shepard being willingly modified with Reaper tech, like the Elusive Man or Saren before him. And whilst there are some elements in each of those that I would definitely be interested in seeing, none of them, at least on paper, share the scale or finality of the choices that we eventually got. There's always something unexplained or fundamentally misaligned with the ideas of the rest of the series, even with what little information we have on how those ideas would have panned out. And again, I think that it's beyond stupid to point to other possibilities and say, well, Mass Effect 3's endings are good because in an alternate universe we got worse ones. But equally, I do think that they tied up the trilogy in a genuinely interesting and impactful way, and that in pointing to the other options that are on the table, we can gain a little perspective and see that there are actually numerous ways in which this ending makes the most of the loose ends and unanswered questions that inescapably come with trying to end such an extensive trilogy. And whilst I'm in the habit of making points that are perhaps flawed in their very reasoning, I want to talk a little more about the Citadel DLC, as although I did mention it as a facet of the ending earlier, I feel that I need to explain that a bit more closely now. Because once again, the Citadel DLC was a paid add-on that many wouldn't have experienced in Mass Effect 3, and which was only added almost a full year after the game's initial release. And I want to reiterate that I'm not trying to say that there shouldn't be any outrage to begin with, or that people's other complaints or opinions are somehow invalid because I had a better time with the endings than they did. Because I do agree that games should be finished on launch, and we absolutely shouldn't have to turn to paying full AAA 
AAA prices for games that need to be bolstered with a series of patches or downloadable content. But, whilst the Citadel DLC isn't necessary to enjoy the endings of Mass Effect 3, I do think that it does a great job of supporting them, and that anyone who was considering picking up the trilogy for cheap, or maybe buying or otherwise accessing the Legendary Edition, which comes with all of the DLC included, should definitely make sure to play through the Citadel story, and to do so at the optimal point, which is right before you set off on the final mission to attack the Cerberus base at the end of the game. The DLC is the best example of fan service that I can remember seeing, bringing together all of the most beloved characters of the trilogy, well, those who are still alive. And allowing them to interact together for the first time as the crew of the Normandy take shore leave. Old friends and new crew team up to take down an emerging threat, but it also includes a new area of the Citadel for players to enjoy, with a combat arena where you can fight alongside any surviving squadmate from the series, and a casino and an arcade, among other things. You get to spend quality time with each one of those characters who you've come to know and love, and the interactions between them all, not to mention the one-to-one -one moments with each, are probably better worked than at any other point in the franchise. At the end, after defeating the new menace and partying hard for one last time, we and all of our allies line up, ready to board the Normandy and go to the final assault, knowing that this is the last time that they'll all get to be together like this. Given what I said earlier about the emotional resonance of Mass Effect 3 and it being about the characters and the journey, a word that I've already used enough times that I'm really starting to hate saying it, I think that this scene in particular is actually a really important part of the ending that isn't usually included in discussions surrounding it, but has retroactively become a part of that perfect build-up to the final moments that I mentioned earlier. Once again, just priming you perfectly for the endings that we do experience and adding a bit more weight to the moments when, for instance, we speak to Shepard's friends before the final assault, or see visions that we've lost and of Shepard's love interest from throughout the series. And maybe that's why I always find the endings to be so poignant and emotionally astute. They feel like such a beautiful conclusion to a beautiful journey, and moments such as, in my playthrough it was Garrus, telling Joker that they can't keep waiting for Shepard and will have to leave without them, always really get to me. But for all of my babbling on, there's one factor that stands head and shoulders above all else when it comes to why I believe that Mass Effect 3's endings are not just good, but truly, truly great. And that's the secret real reason for this video, which is that of the four solutions presented to us by the Catalyst, not one of them is perfect. In fact, they're all kind of terrible. Sure, each one has its strengths, but that's exactly what I mean. There is no one morally superior answer and there is no clinical clean-cut ending, yet there's still something to fight for, still something that will reward you for choosing it. And that fact is why they're still hotly debated amongst many Mass Effect fans even 11 years after the game's release. Their complexities and imperfections far surpass, in my mind, the boring and often illogical karma systems of something like, for instance, the first Bioshock game, where there is always one good ending that you're compelled to achieve, and it restricts how you play and the freedom in how you approach the game. To expand upon that example, Bioshock offers you a decision point every time you discover a little sister, the mutated little girls who stick needles in dead bodies, and your outlook, or the outlook of the character who you want to play as, might change at some point in the game with regards to whether you want to reverse their biological engineering or put them out of their misery. But if you choose the latter option even one time, the ending changes from Jack, the protagonist, becoming a loving father who forms a bond with these lost children, to transforming into a tyrant who invades planet Earth using nuclear weaponry. There's literally no in-between. And at the other end of the spectrum, it's nice to see a genuine sense of consequence and philosophical debate in an ending where the final choice isn't defined by a simple morality system. Normally, these types of endings feel quite flat to me, as the game is over, making the choice feel relatively irrelevant. Like in Fallout 4, you can choose which faction you're going to pledge your allegiance to, thus positioning you as the key cog in the fight for the future of the Commonwealth. But does anyone actually care? All of the characters that you like are going to be okay, and the main difference that you'll notice is which base you go back to when you fancy chilling with the boys. You can't really praise or criticise any decision because there aren't any implications to any of them. Or at least, there are a lot less visible implications than there are, to bring it back to the point of the video, at the end of Mass Effect 3. And Fallout 4, unlike Mass Effect 3, doesn't even end at that point. It's just... it means nothing. Instead of genuinely determining the fate of a galaxy that you've slowly come to know and love across the course of three games, you basically just decide which hub you want to live in, in some place that you've never been before. 
and at worst you'll catch a little flack from your companions over siding with the evil organisation who replace people with robots for like, no reason. Compared to the serious weight of consequence behind each of the endings in Mass Effect 3, I can, I can deal with a little bit of shade from my main character's companion. Personally, the eight endings that Mass Effect offers, based upon four different choices that each have their own merits, and the implications of each, are far, far more interesting than something along those lines. And although I've seen some people wield the ending's imperfections as a weapon to beat them down with, I see them instead as perhaps the game's greatest strength. Like, nobody said that saving the galaxy was going to be easy, Craig. Get off your fucking high horse and make a difficult decision, you heathen. Seriously though, there's a whole lot of loss in this game as it is, and I think that it would be a betrayal of the series and of Mass Effect 3 in particular if defeating the Reapers came at no real cost. This ain't a Marvel movie buddy, you and your friends are gonna die. But although I've spoken about how the final choice presents us with imperfect endings, I haven't really detailed why said endings are imperfect. And to demonstrate this, I'd like us to move into part 2, where we'll be taking a closer look at each ending and what makes this such a tough and enduring decision for many. Because for me, that's the key factor to the successes of the endings of Mass Effect 3. Alright, so the same caveats apply as before. This isn't about telling you what's right, and it's definitely not about telling you what's wrong. I understand if this video gains some views and gets some comments, then people will probably have strong feelings about this. But equally, your playthrough is your playthrough. There's no need to get aggressive or to make it anyone else's problem. Sorry, just people get really, really angry about this, and I do not have the patience for their nonsense. So, jumping right into the first ending that I'm going to speak about today, let's look into what happens if you choose to reject the choices that you're given. You might have noticed I haven't really spoken about this one all that much, and um, that's about to change. Full disclosure, I've never actually chosen this one outside of just reloading the last 20 odd minutes of the game to play through it and see what it's like. And what it's like is... Why the fuck would anyone choose this? No, to be fair, there are pros and cons with this one, just as there are with the others, and having been added with the release of the extended cut, and being the ending that differs most from the other three, the reject ending is really, really interesting to me. So you can achieve it either by telling the Catalyst that you refuse to take part in deciding the fate of Trillions like this, or saying that you will and then shooting a child in the face a few times for shits and giggles. So again, why would someone do this? Well, from the people that I've spoken to, it seems to me that there are two main reasons. The first revolves around defying the corrupt principles of an artificial intelligence dedicated to the genocidal annihilation of trillions of lives every 50,000 years. Fair enough. And the second comes from questioning the motives and reality of, again, an artificial intelligence dedicated to the genocidal annihilation of trillions of lives every 50,000 years. Namely, the latter is mainly predicated upon indoctrination theory. Which is basically that Shepard's war against the Reapers has seen them become indoctrinated by them, as close proximity to Reapers and their technology is shown to do to countless individuals throughout the series. Although the most strong-willed individuals do seem less susceptible to this tactic, very few remain entirely unaffected by the mental control exacted upon them by the Reapers, and most will completely bow down to the wishes of their ancient overlords. Their view and interpretation of the world and events around them are fundamentally skewed, and as such it has become hypothesised that Commander Shepard, having spent so much time adjacent to Reaper technology across the course of the franchise, probably has a couple of screws loose by the time it comes to making this decision. And some of the people who believe this deem that the correct decision to make here is to reject the premises established by the Catalyst who, again again, has been fighting for you and your loved ones to go extinct and has vaporised countless interstellar species into oblivion. And also who has the power to twist the minds of organic entities until they serve its will. Declining to participate in the Catalyst proposals might therefore seem like the right move, especially as it could also be argued that there is no ability to rely upon the final cutscenes and epilogue, as everything at this point is unreliable, affected by the indoctrination efforts of the Catalyst against the mind and perception of Commander Shepard. And this is a very useful tool for those who argue that rejecting is the right move, because, well, because the ending straight up tells you that you're wrong. That's right, if you choose to reject the options offered to you at the end of the third game, the Reapers just annihilate the galaxy. Like, even if you feel defiant in the face of the pretty conclusive verdict that Then you will die knowing that you failed to save everything you fought for. It's generally difficult to argue with the results. 
we watch as the cycle continues, the Reapers wiping out the forces that we've spent the entire trilogy amassing, and the final message of the game is delivered by Liara, in the form of a recorded message, a warning left for the species of the next cycle, in the hope that they can avoid the mistakes made by our own. She states that they failed to stop the Reapers, that the Crucible didn't work, and that fighting as a united galaxy wasn't enough. Following the credits, we then see the Stargazer scene that plays out at the end of each ending, but with a different figure telling the stories as Buzz Aldrin, who voices the Stargazer in the other endings, is, I guess, extinct now. I suppose that the similarities between this scene with an entirely different species and the original version of the Stargazer scene could be cited as an argument in favour of the idea that this is all actually some indoctrinated vision. How likely is it that, in a completely different timeline, in a completely different cycle, two members of a completely different species would have almost the exact same conversation, in the exact same spot, on the exact same planet in the galaxy? Doesn't it seem likelier that this is just a slight tweak on some fabricated vision instead? Never expected the Reapers to have such lazy writing. Maybe Shepard demanded a better ending and that Catalyst had to rush this one out by May of the same year. But equally, that distrust of what we see before us is more or less the only argument here. Shepard's statement that they fight for the right to be free and the chance to choose their own fates, which is what they tell the Catalyst as a symbol of their defiance as they make this decision, personally never rang true to me. Like, you did fight for the ability to be free, and for the chance to choose your own fate. And now you have the choices that will each provide you with the ability to be free, and for a representative of the galactic community, rather than the hitherto unknown catalyst, to determine the future of the Milky Way. And then choosing this ending is, to the best of our knowledge, throwing away both of those opportunities, saying, nah, I don't want to choose, let's stick with that decision you made aeons ago. Also, I think that death is the ultimate freedom because I'm an edgy 14 year old boy. And um, again, I'm going to do this for all of them, I'm not actually calling you an edgy 14 year old boy if you chose this one. Although, if the ins and outs of British politics have taught me anything, it's that representative democracy will stick you with a bunch of people who just refuse to do anything to help their electorate. Like, shooting this child is actually quite a good metaphor for my local MP consistently just not showing up to votes that directly affect our constituency. Well, this is my new favourite ending. Video over, thanks for what- Actually, it's also worth noting that indoctrination theory was never intended as the true ending of the game, as was stated by writer Chris Hepler, who said that Bioware loved the idea but, quote, weren't that smart. Seeing as Hepler worked as a writer on the game, as well as on Mass Effect 2, and was credited as an additional designer on the original in 2007, I think it's probably fair to lend some weight to that testimony, which I don't know if there's any real evidence for it in the games that's generally pointed to, I don't think you really hear people talk about it so much anymore, but like, if they didn't think to put it in, it's at best a coincidence if it's there, you know? I don't know. Anyway, the reject ending is clearly flawed, and yet probably more than all of the others. If you're right about it, well then, fuck me, you're right on the money there. The stakes are hardly low with any of them, but this is probably the most high risk, high reward of all. And you've got to admire going to bat for this one, knowing what it could well mean for the fate of everyone in the galaxy. In the words of Admiral Anderson himself, What if we wrong about him? Why then we're wrong? <laughs> and, as we'll see, the other endings are all also fucked. <laughs>Destroy is the most popular ending of all, by a whole 15%, which is a pretty significant margin when there are four options on the table, so the likelihood is that some of the people watching this video felt that this was the right ending for their Mass Effect story. And, you know, good on ya, because if you manage to build up enough war assets and military strength to achieve the best of the Destroy endings, then your version of Commander Shepard perhaps, maybe, kinda, sorta, survived. It's ambiguous, but then this bozo survived being brain dead for two years after falling from space, so being at the heart of an explosion that wipes out the mass relays, and also all synthetic life in the galaxy, probably doesn't mean shit to them. And I've definitely known people who chose this ending for this reason, time and time again, which, understandable, have a nice day. Commander Shepard is a huge asset to the galaxy, as is proven in the third game, and to have them during the events that follow the Reaper War would surely be a huge help to the galactic community. Destroy is also the only ending available to you if you progress without accruing enough assets to unlock the others. So anyone who only played the third game, which statistically must have been quite a few, at least at one point in time, probably goes for this one. 
And you just know that there are some weirdos out there who just played the third game in the Legendary Edition. Not to mention that if you're a long-time Mass Effect fan, you probably know how difficult it is to deviate from your original choices, even if you made them almost 16 years ago now. But all of this sounds like I'm writing off those who chose Destroy, and I definitely don't mean to do that. There are some very genuine reasons to go with this ending, and the fact that it is the preferred option of the largest portion of the huge number of people playing Mass Effect is no laughing matter. Then again. People like Coldplay and voted for the Nazis. You can't trust people, Jeremy. Actually, that sounds like I'm having a go again. I've picked Destroy many times. I just mean, let's take a look at people's reasoning rather than trusting them because they are Legion. Many, I mean, not the, not the character. I think probably my favourite argument in favour of Destroy is also one of the simplest. This is the only solution of the three, and only option of the four, that rids the galaxy of the Reaper threat in any sort of absolute. If you reject, the Reapers continue to cut through you and your allies. If you control, the Reapers still exist, simply acting under the guidance of Commander Shepard. And if you synthesize, the Reapers remain, their directive of eradicating advanced organic life simply no longer present. Destroy is the only ending that, with certainty, eradicates Reapers entirely. There is no chance that they will return, at least from what we are told, and the galaxy can finally move on with absolute certainty from the cycle of destruction that has hindered all life or progress since the dawn of the last umpteen galactic communities. Who's to say that the Reapers won't somehow be utilized in this way again in either of the other solutions? And if there's any chance that these beings, these god machines who emerge from the depths of dead space to systematically exterminate even the most advanced civilizations that the galaxy has known, could once again be turned against the helpless citizens of the galactic community, then why wouldn't we want to make sure that they never return? Well, there is still a problem with that argument, I suppose, in that the Reapers are just being used this entire time and to destroy them when the option is there to free them of this control, especially in any sort of preemptive strike, just in case they decide to do a genocide that they have no reason to decide to do, is kind of messed up. Reapers have feelings too, you know? Seriously though, the destroy ending is a genocide of all synthetic life in the galaxy, and that is, in and of itself, not all that different to what the Reapers themselves are doing. I've seen some argue this point by stating that Edie and the Geth can be rebuilt, but like, that's not how life works. This game spends so long demonstrating the validity of synthetic life and that artificial life forms still have a right to their existence. And this argument seems to completely ignore all of that and pretend that rebuilding someone is the same as having the original. But like, if I told you I was going to murder you and then use your DNA to create a clone, I'm pretty sure you'd understand that that is not the same person as yourself. Creating a consciousness, or a soul, as the Geth put it to their creators, is just not feasible. The dead, I'm afraid, are dead, and creating some weird tribute act version after the Reapers have been destroyed isn't going to exonerate you from what you've done. Like I said, saving the galaxy isn't simple, and more often than not, it involves necessitating the systematic destruction of an entire species, or, as we see in the Destroy ending, several. Now, this isn't a unique problem, by any means. Three of the four endings feature or necessitate genocide, and the other definitely has its own problems, but we'll get to that. However, the Destroy ending is probably the most direct and certain route to that. Not only does it involve the wiping out of all synthetic life, just then and there, but it also, unlike each of the other endings, doesn't solve the problem that the Reapers were built to address. If you let them continue, they will continue to prevent organic life from developing synthetic life forms capable of wiping out all life at a cellular level. If you decide to control the Reapers, Commander Shepard can apply them to the policing of rogue AI, and if you choose synthesis, synthetic life will have no means or reasoning to end organic life in the galaxy. But if you choose destroy, synthetic life will eventually return, and when it does, the same problems will remain, only without the Reapers there to enact a solution. And that is my favourite argument against destroy, because at best it's the eradication of all synthetic life and then nothing happens, and at worst it does that and then dooms the galaxy to suffer the fate that the Reapers were designed to prevent. Not only with the intelligent races such as the Salarians and the Asari and the Turians and the Krogan and the Rachni and the Humans and the Elcor and the Volus and the Hanna and the Drell and the Vorcha, and all of the others that I've probably missed still go extinct, but so would the Yarg and the Pijax and the Varan and even the f***ing trees. As the Catalyst says, the peace won't last. 
even as an in-between, you have the likelihood that once the mass relays are destroyed and the citizens of the galaxy are stranded where they are, many of them floating around above Earth of course, the fatalities and struggles of the rebuild and the time taken to get back to any kind of galactic community will be hugely exacerbated by the lack of Reapers, whose loyal hordes, mega anims of technological advances and knowledge, and also just them being real big, would really come in handy as the galaxy struggles to return to some kind of normal. Regular life, resource gathering and emergency services will be completely changed, many will be stuck on the other side of the galaxy to their loved ones, and there will be billions stranded in a solar system that couldn't support them even if its one inhabitable planet hadn't just spent like six months being ravaged by all those giant interstellar monsters and their horrifying zombie army. They turned London into Birmingham. Imagine how uninhabitable Birmingham is. And I think that this lack of now helpful Reapers is reflected as Hackett narrates us through the Destroy ending. He points to the monumental task of rebuilding as so many of the technologies and synthetics that organics rely upon are now gone, not to mention all of those that died in the biggest war in the galactic community's history. He does sound optimistic, but not nearly as positive in immediacy as the narrator in some of the other endings. Notably, he says, We can rebuild everything that was destroyed going to show that the lessons that we learn towards the end of the game have not been learned by the rest of the galaxy, who seem doomed to repeat the same mistakes. I did have a great argument in favour of Destroy that I remembered last night when I was in bed, then foolishly decided that I would remember in the morning so I didn't need to get up and write it down. And seeing as I'm currently saying this, I clearly haven't remembered it yet. Which is annoying. Rest assured that it was completely amazing and would have convinced you all to choose Destroy for the rest of time. But on a serious note, I'm talking about that because it goes to show that there isn't, and was never really meant to be, some definitive argument one way or another. I know I keep talking about how every choice is valid, but this is more a moment of reflection on the fact that there won't ever really be a wrong answer, which sounds the same, but is just meant as more of a celebration of the game's ability to serve up a great ending for every player, no matter which way they're inclined. And I think that this is a part of why people get so tribal about this. Their choice feels so right, and it's the perfect conclusion for their iteration of the story. So, yeah, bonus points to Bioware for that one. And I definitely think that it's noteworthy that Javik, who is the galaxy's foremost expert on the Reapers, given that he is the last surviving Prothean, born and raised in a society that had been at war with the Reapers for centuries at that point, is firmly in the Destroy camp. He has seen and knows their tactics better than anyone else, and has a unique and valuable perspective that we, as humans from the current cycle who did not know the galaxy beforehand, inherently cannot have. Javik states time and time again that the Reapers have to be destroyed, and as though he was created with some understanding of how the game was going to end, this view that he has extends to all artificial intelligence and synthetic life forms. You know, everything that would die in the destroy ending. He instructs you to kill Legion, for instance, a close friend and a valued synthetic crewmate, and a key diplomatic presence in negotiating a crucial alliance between the Quarians and the Geth. And Javik also constantly questions and openly distrusts the artificial intelligence Edie, despite her importance to the survival of the crew and being a useful teammate and asset in the war. He's certainly experienced in fighting the Reapers, and he's certainly consistent in his attitudes towards dealing with them, as we see when he discusses how indoctrinated Prothean separatists suggested controlling the Reapers, and how there can be no recourse but to destroy the Reapers entirely, along with any ideas that might aid or preserve them. But the society that Javik comes from, and the way that they were structured around their interactions with other organic societies, actually put me more in the mind of the control ending. He details in your conversations how the Protheans were in favour of subjugation and vassalisation, using that to absorb and benefit from the other species of their time rather than simply waging war and destroying them. They were the strongest, highlights Javik, and therefore, he believes, had the right to assimilate others, and to dictate the nature of the galaxy in this way. Eventually, even a palette of many paints, as the galaxy surely was, starts to blend into one colour. Prothean. And when the Reaper War began, that was the banner under which the galaxy fought. This reminded me, funnily enough, of the way that we experience the Reapers throughout the game. They emerge, a physically and technologically superior force, whose order is imposed upon the galactic community through the supposed mandate offered by their warring prowess. They absorb other races, preferring to indoctrinate and or turn them into their own forces rather than destroying them outright, 
And although the husks and the brutes and the marauders and the banshees are each separate from one another, they also fall under the umbrella term of reapers, adhering to the whims and motivations of the all-powerful machines. And yet Javik's idea that it is natural for the weak to be controlled by the strong doesn't extend to the reapers, perhaps because of the synthetic element. Ideologically though, they still seem somewhat similar, and although I don't believe that it would change his views, I do wonder what Javik would make of the reapers' actual motivations should he know them, and the control ending's ability to use the reapers to prevent a synthetic uprising, as, with this being their purpose, rather than the destruction of organics, the field of play is so drastically changed, and so anti-synthetic that I can't help but feel that he might be a little less certain. And returning to the Prothean similarities to the reapers, it's interesting to me that Javik, unless I'm missing or forgetting something, never really seems to address this, and certainly doesn't reflect it in his beliefs. Maybe he was an outlier in terms of his views, or maybe his perspective has changed following his feeling that he must avenge his species, or maybe he just doesn't see the connection, or is less enthusiastic about handing that much power to a race other than his own, which doesn't seem all that far-fetched given his, uh, lack of sympathy for the other species in control of this cycle. Amusing. Asari have finally mastered writing. I'm sorry. However, as a caveat to more or less every point that arises from studying Javik's opinion, I would point out that it's very hard to tell which parts of what he says are objectively correct, as we have a limited understanding of the events before Protheans went extinct, and what we do know mostly comes from the mouth of somebody who is ardently in favour of one particular solution, and who clearly is not to be blindly idolised. So, whether his positions or the evidence that they provide turns us in favour of destroy or against that notion, and as I say, it's kind of both, we shouldn't rely so heavily on a sole ambassador to understand all of the trillions of lives and opinions of even the Protheans alone, let alone all of the species that have been rendered extinct by the Reapers in past cycles. Yes, his input is incredibly valuable, but it might not be the most reliable morsel of an idea to base our entire view, and the most important decision in the history of the galaxy, upon. Besides, the Protheans themselves are problematic and a moral hotbed of concerning beliefs who themselves failed miserably in their fight against the reapers so it's difficult to know what to take from them and their ideas you know sorry that's just a, a really anticlimactic end to that discussion i am surrounded by primitives interestingly both of the key arguments that i mentioned in favor of the reject ending have been offered to me as evidence in support of destroy which is definitely worth a mention. The destroy ending again defies the catalyst, which clearly prefers both control and, most of all, synthesis to this particular solution. However, I would also say that it's a lot less defiant, and doesn't exactly distance itself from the reasons that we might have a moral opposition to the catalyst solutions in the first place. Above all else, it really just feels like a simple solution to a simple question of how to stop the Reapers. As your renegade shepherd in particular will reiterate a number of times, the answer is at any cost. The problem, however, comes when we account for the complexities of the Reapers' reasoning and the other solutions on offer. Not that everyone who chooses to destroy is doing this by any means, but it does feel a bit head in the sand to stick to this ending just because it was already agreed upon, seeing as the goalposts have just been moved to an entirely different stadium, and the already ethically questionable concept of sacrificing billions of lives to save trillions definitely needs at least a little reconsidering under this new lens through which no sacrifice is necessarily necessary. And secondly, of the points used to argue in favour of reject, indoctrination theory. Because although Hepler's comments still apply regarding the possibility of the idea being accurate, I have to say that it does again tend to work in favour of this particular ending. This time, it is generally argued that destroying the Reapers is the only solution that is ever considered prior to the conversation with the Catalyst, being fought for by Anderson, Hackett, more or less every likeable character in the series, Shepard included, of course. And if there's one thing that we know about the rules of fiction, is that the likeable characters are always right, and that certainly rings true of the events of the Mass Effect trilogy. Except for, you know, all those times that it doesn't. But it is a fair point, why would we strive all of a sudden for a peaceful coexistence with the Reapers? Seems suspicious that when we finally come so close to destroying them, the agreed upon parameters of the war that begins when they invade the galaxy with the express intention of exterminating us all, they're all like, no, wait, don't destroy us, we can be friends, don't you love the Geth and that robot pal of yours? And when you add that to the argument that Saren Arterius and the Elusive Man, the indoctrinated villains of the first and third games respectively, are the series' two main proponents of the other two choices, synthesis and control, I can see why people might think that destroy, the idea presented by those whom we can trust, is the right path. 
Saren suggests cooperation and augmentation so that the Reapers will spare organic life. Whilst the elusive man tirelessly advocates for an understanding of the Reapers and their technology, particularly that which they use to indoctrinate, so that humanity might harness their Lovecraftian strength and use a control of the Reapers to establish dominance over the galaxy, a project that is fully in motion at Sanctuary in Mass Effect 3, where his organisation, Cerberus, are seen to be making breakthroughs in their efforts to control the Reapers. If you are of the human supremacist persuasion, you might not see what's wrong with that, at which point I would direct you to the fact that Sanctuary is a faux refugee camp, designed to lure in unsuspecting victims of the war so that they can be experimented upon and turned into mindless monsters that the elusive man seeks to control. And if you don't see what's wrong with that, seek help. I've never found this argument to be as watertight as it might initially appear. Indoctrination theory makes a lot more sense to me as a facet of reject rather than destroy. Why would you be able to trust the validity of one opinion but not the others? Also, like, many of the characters who would likely be indoctrinated, were Shepard the same, speak in favour of destroying the Reapers, which seems... odd. But also, I'm not convinced that Saren or the Elusive Man are irrefutable indoctrinated champions of the respective endings assigned to them in this argument. Saren's ideology was never actually aligned with synthesis, never even confronting the problem or the solutions that are given to us by the catalyst in the first place. No, Saren's view is only really concerned with cooperation in the name of survival, somewhat similarly to the Geth who are making a pact of sorts with the Reapers in Mass Effect 3. And to those who point to his Reaper augmentations as evidence of a belief in synthesis, I would point in return to the Elusive Man, who is seen in this argument as signifying control, not synthesis, and has similar Reaper augmentations, which of more of a desire to increase their own abilities than of a belief in a synthesis ending. Instead, I would argue that a much better representative of the values of said ending is Legion, a Geth platform who we meet in Mass Effect 2 and who almost single-handedly brings the Geth to fight against the Reapers in the third game. Now, I've mentioned the Geth 12 times already, and that being the unlucky 13th, you're in for a quick history lesson. So, the Quarians, these unbearable fuckers, <laughs> built the Geth as their servants, basically. But the Geth started to develop more and more cognitive abilities until, one day, one Geth platform was like, Hey boss, do I got a f***ing soul? And the Quarians, who really, really hate philosophy, enacted a genocide against the Geth in return. However, the Quarians, being completely f***ing useless, managed to lose the genocide, a feat only ever previously achieved by Australia in the Emu War of 1932. This got them exiled from their own planet, and now they're playing victim whilst also preparing to finish the Geth off once and for all. It's the most direct contemporary analogy that we have for the Catalyst's argument that synthetics will eventually rise up against organics. And, to be fair to the Reaper mastermind, it's not wrong that, well, that the synthetics absolutely f***ing bodied their creators. Never in history has there been such a comprehensive self-own. Legion, however, provides us with an interesting insight into how the Geth actually operate, and their views on the creators and the conflict that ensued. In the third game, Legion works tirelessly to stop the Geth who have sided with the Reapers in order to enhance themselves and prevent destruction at the hands of their creators. And in doing so, Legion facilitates a peaceful resolution between the two species. So, how does this reflect a support for the synthesis of artificial and organic life? Well. Legion sacrifices their life in the third game in order to give the Geth a higher operating function, not only making them stronger but also gifting them with an individuality and capability for complex thought that are more typical of organic life, which is inherently self-knowing and tied to its bodily form. And this change is evidenced in Legion's final moments, when Edie, the artificial intelligence who operates on board the Normandy and becomes available as a squad mate in the third game, notes that in Legion's final moments they refer to themselves not by the we that they normally do, but as I, meaning that they became a fully actualized independent self in the vein of the organic crewmates throughout the series before death, exemplifying the synthesis-adjacent nature of the evolution that they have given to their species, creating the first Geth capable of true free will and cooperation with organic life, and doing so through imbuing in them more organic qualities that bridge the gap between the previously polar opposites of synthetic and organic life. Legion believes so fully in bringing the Geth into a space between their formerly solely synthetic cells and the organics who had previously waged war against them, that they die sacrificing themselves to allow that to happen. 
organic and synthetic life go from being two distinct, mutually exclusive states that there could not be any compromise or cooperation between, to being indistinguishably alive, finally providing a comprehensive answer to the geth question that began the war. Hey, hey boss, boss, do I got a fucking soul? And through successfully applying the organic concept of the soul to the synthetic body of the geth, Legion has done a synthesis. And looping all of that back to my point about Saren, I think that this disproves the argument that destroying is inherently correct because it's the only one championed by a hero rather than a villain. Firstly, because Legion, the true torchbearer for Synthesis, is a hero, and secondly, because the Geth Synthesis ends the war between them and the Quarians, providing actual evidence of this solution peacefully resolving the supposedly inevitable conflict and destruction. Interestingly, the Reaper on Rannoch, in its dying moments, says that the Quarian Geth War is proof that order must be brought to the chaos through the harvesting process, but Legion proves it horribly, horribly wrong, and it's actually a combined Quarian and Geth fleet that destroy it. And we prefer actual evidence here to arguments that simply state, well, if a bad guy said it, it must be wrong, which is not how anything works. There are countless examples of even Mass Effect's most sympathetic characters being horribly, horribly wrong, and I think that it would be oversimplistic and frankly a betrayal of the series' stellar character work to boil everything down to good guys right, bad guys wrong. See evidence article number two, which is the elusive man, who, thoroughly evil and influenced though he obviously is, is not, even by the end of the game, fully under Reaper control. He still has enough free will to conduct the monstrous experiments at Sanctuary that, though utterly barbaric and beyond the point of defending, are malevolent in a different way to that which the Reapers are, genuinely seeking to control them rather than just handing them husks to bolster their forces. Look, I don't want to sound like I'm defending or, worse, condoning Cerberus' experiments, but the reason that the Reapers invade and destroy Sanctuary, unless I'm mistaken, is because they determine that Cerberus' operations there are a genuine threat to their power, or, at the very least, represent present a very real defiance of their ideals that does not align with the actions of someone who has simply been indoctrinated. For better or for worse, figures such as Anderson, Shepard, Saren, and the Elusive Man are shown to have excellent willpower, and I do believe that, in both of the villains mentioned, there exists the ability to withdraw from that indoctrinated state, as it is not yet fully set in. Both figures can be persuaded to see reason at the end of the game in which they serve as the organic representative of the Reapers, which, seeing the fault in their own opinion? They sound less indoctrinated than insert your political opponent here, ultimately deciding in both instances to take their own life rather than to become a fully indoctrinated pawn under Reaper control. That is, as long as you don't mess it up like I did and try mixing it up with an intimidate option when you talk to the elusive man on Mars, which will prevent you from being able to get through to him at the end and you won't get the sweet release of watching him unalive himself. Oh no. What if I was the edgy 14 year old all along? But I can't keep dwelling on the fact that I'm going to have to go back 60 hours just to get that one dialogue option and this is becoming a bit of an elusive man discussion. So maybe it's time that we moved on and took a look at the control ending. So a lot of what I have to say about the control and synthesis endings kind of came up in the destroy section so please just bear that all in mind and spare us like 20 odd minutes of recapping those ideas. Okay, thanks. Right then, control. Obviously there's the whole, you know, not killing all synthetic life thing, and that's good. But let's look under the surface at some of the other arguments that there are to be had here. For instance, whereas Shepard's ability to live on in the destroy ending is undoubtedly a huge asset to the galaxy as they look to rebuild, having them in charge of the Reaper fleet surely only increases that benefit by an incomprehensible amount. In narrating this ending, Commander Shepard points to how they could only give hope and assistance beyond the scope of their natural lifespan and corporeal capabilities through preserving themselves in this way, and giving themselves the power to help, guide, and generally protect the galaxy through elevating themselves to being capable of achieving more than they in their human form could ever hope to achieve. I will rebuild what the many have lost. I will create a future with limitless possibilities. I will protect and sustain. I will act as guardian for the many. But that line at the end there also brings the nature of Shepard's solution to the inevitable synthetic organic divide into question. Because acting as a guardian for the many, as noble as it is, also implies that there are some for whom Shepard will not act so benevolently. I mentioned representative democracy earlier, and it's also relevant here, as democratic modes of government, for all of the obvious benefits that should never be impeded, 
does have its flaws, and one of the major ones is the concept of a tyranny of the majority. So whether it's politicians vying for more votes or referenda that are decided by which side is more popular, democracy, the handing of power to the many, will always generally favour the many and the most popular opinion. If 80% of people need one thing and 20% of people need another thing and you only have the capacity to do one of those things, well, guess which one gets picked? And if said things are based upon consistent unchangeable characteristics, so the 20% have always and will always need that thing, and the 80% have always and will always need what it is that they get, well, the 20% are never going to have their needs fulfilled. And the many mentioned in the control ending, when you think in the long term of the inevitable outcomes, are almost certainly organics. Because synthetics are the only ones who are going to rise up and destroy all organics. As the catalyst states of the destroy ending, it's impossible to think that the galaxy would progress without the technologies and synthetics that they have come to rely upon. Only synthetics are capable of forever exterminating the other. So what happens? Well, let's think for a moment about the way that synthetics become threats in Mass Effect. It is generally incredibly quick, and on the occasions that Shepard has come face to face with rogue artificial intelligences or Geth, they have been capable of wreaking huge destruction almost instantaneously. As such, synthetic life would need to be proactively oppressed in order to repress any sudden uprising before it was too late, inevitably descending into the partial or total subjugation of synthetic life even with someone as exceptional as Shepard at the wheel. There would still be genocide and there would still be domineering, and although the control ending only allows Shepard to assume direct control of the Reapers, they would need to rigorously police the production and existence of synthetic life feasibly only further incentivizing some sort of violent synthetic revolution. And of course, similarly to how the Destroy ending eradicates the Reapers just as they might finally gain independence from their harvesting directive, the Control ending also doesn't allow them that freedom, simply having Shepard take full control, which, yeah, I get that these are the Reapers I'm talking about here, but as fully functioning intelligences and the last remnants of the quadrillions of members of once thriving species that are now extinct because of the Reapers, it seems unfortunate to keep them locked in that servitude for the rest of time. Didn't really expect myself to be defending the bodily autonomy of these giant squid gods, but then again, if we're looking for the best possible ending, why shouldn't I? I think it's a very fair question to ask to what extent the old life, as the Catalyst calls it, from previous cycles, which has been stored in Reaper form, could come into play. What freedoms would be offered to it? Will it get its own Shore Leave Citadel DLC? What could be gained, of course, in terms of advancing technology and the galactic understanding of history? I do think that Synthesis facilitates this to a greater degree than the other endings, as it offers the most freedoms and willful cooperation. But Control, unlike Destroy, does at least preserve the prior species, and who knows how Shepard could utilise their knowledge and history. On that kind of who knows note though, it must be said that as much as I trust my Commander Shepard, there's definitely no guarantee that leaving them in charge of the most powerful force in the history of the galaxy is a good idea. They are, after all, only human, and it's very possible to get to the end of the games and choose this option whilst also kind of being a terrible person. You can very easily spend the entire trilogy being a weird racist piece of shit who kills people for fun and believes that humanity should be in control of the galaxy. Fuck it, it's fun to play that way, like I'm no stranger to a renegade playthrough, but equally, is it necessarily a good idea to trust that person to dictate the future of the entire galactic community in a situation where nobody is capable of challenging them? Probably not. And even if you're a boring old goody two-shoes the entire time, having that much power has, can, and will change people. The first result on a quick Google search brought me to this article in Psychology Today, and seeing as I'm already really sick of taking notes for this video, I'm going to trust it completely. So even though it seems that there are some benefits to how people with more power can behave, it also seems that power can lead to more abstract and simplified thought, more stereotyping and resolving only the core details of a situation. People in power judge others more strictly and demonstrate less understanding of others' perspectives whilst also violating social norms and conventions to a greater degree, especially when it comes to aiding their own personal goals. So, to have the unprecedented power that Shepard has might not be the best idea, even if they're the most angelic angel that's ever angeled. That said, this is all entirely hypothetical, and Shepard no longer even has a human brain to be corrupted, so we're really in uncharted territory here. And once again, I maybe wouldn't use this to support or write off this ending. You know who else has a lot of power though? The Elusive Man. And boy oh boy is he fucking problematic. Sanctuary, the fake refugee camp that serves as a front for the grotesque experimentation on unwilling prisoners is, as I said earlier, not exactly a good thing. But I can't help but note the implications that it has for the possibility of controlling the Reapers and how, weirdly, they're not actually all that disastrous. 
Priority Horizon, the mission in which we uncover the events at Sanctuary, details how the Reapers, who had really been in bed with Cerberus up until now, attack and destroy the facility at Sanctuary because of the fact that breakthroughs are being made in the Elusive Man and Henry Lawson's mission to discover a way of controlling the Reapers. It seems that their plan is considered a genuine threat by the Great Squiddly Ones themselves, as they attack and destroy the Horizon facility so that Cerberus cannot continue with its utterly monstrous technological advances, weakening and even risking losing an extremely powerful ally in Cerberus in order to put an end to their experimentation. This shows that controlling the Reapers, though a mind-boggling concept, is not a fundamentally flawed one, as otherwise they would not need to prioritise an offensive against this threat, which is tactically inconvenient, seeing as it requires conflict with the indoctrinated extension of their own forces that Cerberus now generally operates as. I'm not saying that Cerberus would ever have been capable of wielding that force of themselves, not that they would have done any good with it, obviously. I mean, even before the indoctrination, those guys did some seriously horrifying stuff. But this does at least point to the fact that, even if only at a conceptual level, the control ending isn't nearly as profoundly unsound as some seem to believe it to be. And thanks to all that waffling on in the destroy section, we're already ready to move on and take a look at the last ending of the four, thank god, which is Synthesis. And here it is, Synthesis. Posited by the Catalyst as the ideal solution, Synthesis is, you might be pleased to know, the only ending that doesn't either explicitly contain or implicitly demand a series of genocides. Lucky us. Which is made possible by the fact that it is the only ending of the four to actually address the Catalyst's initial problem at its core. Synthetics and organics won't inevitably destroy one another if synthetics and organics are the same. There is no rising conflict, there is no unavoidable war, and there is no extermination based upon the root of one side's existence. Instead, there is peace, achieved as the Reapers no longer follow any destructive order, and the species that they were built to keep in check are no longer necessitating that extermination. Edie notes in her commentary on this ending that the Reapers now bring the collective knowledge of the cultures that came before, allowing the galactic community to build back anew, and to be stronger than ever in doing so. Edie cites peaceful coexistence, unlimited access to new knowledge, and an ability to reclaim the galaxy with minimal interruption whilst feasibly transcending mortality itself, and achieving a new plane of existence. The Quarians also finally get to take those stuffy masks off, which is nice. However, as we've already spoken about today, the Synthesis ending is not all that peachy or perfect. First things first, it's a complete nightmare for bodily autonomy. Yes, maybe less so for the Reapers than the other endings, but to inflict a new mode of existence, one that is intrusive even down to the level of their very DNA, with no ability to gain consent or even inform them of what is going to happen, is pretty damn messed up to do to one person, let alone trillions. So many of the organics in the franchise are shown to be fearful of and prejudiced against synthetic life, whilst synthetics lack an understanding of their organic creators that, instantly attained as it is, would cause them to drastically reevaluate their way of life, and just suddenly turning each of them into some kind of cyborg is almost definitely going to create a lot of problems for all involved. There are so many variables here that it's difficult to see it as asserting a certainty over the galaxy, instead having it as more of a wild experiment that could, could, go horribly, horribly wrong. Societal restructuring is no easy feat, and doing so whilst rebuilding the entire galaxy, paradisiacal as it seems in the slides, is almost certainly going to be a rough ride. If the Catalyst isn't being truthful, then taking the path that they most firmly advocate for is surely going to end up doing those that you're there to represent a lot more harm than good. Unless it's like, double bluffing or something. Which I suppose would make this the right choice, but then you have to think about why it would lie in the first place and Blah. Oh no, this is a game of mental ping pong! <laughs> and it definitely does seem a little forced, even by the game itself, as this ending is the hardest of the four basic choices to unlock, suggesting that, even if just from the developer's perspective, it is the best one. But then why am I talking about that like it's a bad thing? Mental ping pong. Synthesis is the only one to solve a lot of the problems that it solves, but it's also the only one to raise a lot of the issues and questions that it does. And I can see why it can be seen as overcomplicated in terms of its implications. Kill the Reapers, get rid, or control the Reapers, call them off, or even just nah, I'm gonna dip, are all a lot less philosophically pressing than this, even if it seems to have the most practical benefits of the four. The organosynthetic reapers themselves, however, are a good example of synthesis that's worked. 
Like, you may not like their methods, but goddammit, they get results. And they're also, from what we see, a great example of it happening again. What happens with the freeing of the Reapers is that they are called off, no longer serving the function that they once were, nor any new one under new leadership, whilst also still existing to help the galaxy out. To me, this best fits the Catalyst description of what they are, like a fire, burning because that is what it is built for. And to me, that seems coherent with their purpose as it is characterised in every explanation of their actions that the series ever offers us. But let's not delve too much more into the written qualities of each ending because fuck me this video is already too long and we don't need any of that. Look, this, this is the end. I'm ending it. I'm calling it off. As you may have noticed, I find it difficult to explain exactly why I love the ending of Mass Effect 3 so much. I'm reading back through everything I've compiled and nothing here particularly convinces me and I'm the one who wrote all this shit, I imagine it doesn't do that much for you either. I've played through great endings before, but nothing that combines the consequences and the complexities and the longevity of the Mass Effect 3 ones, and none that have successfully achieved everything that I've spoken about today but even then, it doesn't do justice to what I'm trying to get across. I suppose really that it all boils down to how it makes you individually feel. As I've said, your feelings on the endings and your feelings on which one you choose are all 100% right, because they're yours, they belong to you. And I think that when push comes to shove, the only evidence that I can really offer as to how this makes me feel is how long I've spent discussing this. If Mass Effect 3's endings were, actually, to me, as bad as everyone always said that they are, I then how on earth would I have spent so many hours writing, reading, editing, and uploading this, and so many hours playing through them again and again and again over the years? To me, Mass Effect is perhaps the greatest story ever told, and the endings of the third game only contribute to that belief. And if you're still here, still listening to me talking about them, then maybe you also feel like they're worth quite a lot of your time. Or hell, maybe you still hate them. But either way, I'd love to hear from you in the comments below. So thanks so much for watching, and as always, I hope to see you next time. What do we do? Why don't we just... wait here for a little while. See what happens. Well, that was sure fun. I had a great time! <laughs>